I want to speak today about my research on plant populations in alpine areas of the Karakoram and Himalaya and the forests of eastern North America, some of the challenges that, that face them in the Anthropocene. So as climates change, species will be forced upslope or poleward in order to track suitable habitat. And the question is, how much does ecosystem matter? We know that in flat continental landscapes, suitable habitat will shift poleward over extensive distances relative to species dispersal and migration abilities. In alpine ecosystems, the availability of habitat upslope is ultimately constrained by the mountaintop. So to examine these variable constraints, I want to apply my long-standing research on forest regeneration in the Karakoram uh, Himalayas, as well as uh, my studies of metapopulation dynamics in eastern forests. And let's see where we go from there. Let's begin with alpine ecosystems. So again, in alpine ecosystems, transitions to different climate zones occur over short distances, range responses, likely to be rapid, but there's concern that high alpine populations face extinction as they're forced into ever-shrinking habitat. It's the conical nature of mountain environments. There's a notable dearth of information on my study area, the Central Karakoram, which harbors some of the highest mountains in the world and being located in the subtropics, plant life exists above 4,000 meters. But essentially, the ruggedness of the terrain, the remoteness of the region, and maybe the political situation has limited floristic studies so that regional experts say that many Karakoram species remain to be named and classified. And there is, in fact, an historical data set that dates back to the period of exploration in the 19th and early 20th centuries that I presented in uh, 2016 at the AAG, with which we can evaluate past uh, distribution patterns of species, but we need uh, an updated uh, data set. And so to, to address that gap, I headed to the Carl Forum in 2016, and I visited three different sites. Here they are, the Upper Tully Valley, which is quite remote, the Upper Baum Harrell Valley, uh, just up from uh, the town of Shigar, which is renowned for its medicinal plants, and the Deosai Plateau, which is this world's second highest high plateau next to the Tibetan plateau. This is a relatively arid region. But orographic precipitation uh, feeds relatively lush montane vegetation above about 3,500 meters. So in those three sites, I sampled vegetation along transects following the slope contour within five by five meter uh, quadrats. I also indicated the presence of species and their elevation as I uh, and my research team, including Dr. Sherwali from Karkorm International University, ascended. And what we discovered in a nutshell is that there were a large number of species, about 146. Here they are in flower in July. And more importantly, that they were distributed relatively distinctively into uh, zones with respect to elevation. So this figure shows you one of my sites, a slope in Tele Valley, and you can see that many of the species, uh, which the numbers are in the little uh, quadrangles here, uh, had quite restricted range limits altitudinally. In fact, 32 of them occurred exclusively above 4,000 meters and were restricted elevationally within that particular limit. Interestingly, all of the species that are shown here in green also were restricted regionally, so that they were found only in Tele, 17 of them. So I guess from that information uh, and other uh, data that I obtained from the region, it suggested that there might be some problems with upslope displacement of these populations as climates warm that they stood to be displaced by species lower down and effectively at some point uh, run out of habitat on some peaks. That would potentially lead to local extinctions, especially given the patchy nature of these populations, the kind of lush, species-diverse uh, alpine meadows that I showed you in those slides occurred primarily on north-facing aspects, whereas 
droughtier south-facing aspects tended to support only Artemisia step. So that speaks to some fragility, in addition to some other uh, unknowns, including climate drying and how that will affect populations and the increasing grazing pressure that we find. Well, let's move now from the mountains of Eurasia over to BC, to the extensive, past BC, we're going to skip over BC, past, to the extensive eastern deciduous forests of eastern North America. These mixed wood forests comprise largely of hardwoods like um, sugar maple, American beech, bitternut hickory, extend from south from Florida all the way up to the Great Lakes region and the St. Lawrence River and west towards the prairies. Now, in contrast to alpine ecosystems, flat landscapes present major dispersal barriers to species. So if you look at this figure, Sandal sums it up, essentially in flat landscapes like Eastern North America's uh, extensive uh, forest and tundra ecosystems, the climate change velocity, that is the rate at which species needed to migrate in order to find similar habitat, poleward of their existing habitat, uh, was much, much greater, 10 times or more greater uh, than species migration uh, rates that were required in steep sloped alpine ecosystems. Again, we call that climate change velocity. So that's one problem. It's, it's also combined with the fact that there's intensive settlement in these sorts of flat landscapes, continental expanses, uh, that is often accompanied by ecosystem fragmentation. So we're concerned that there may be extinctions if species are unable to find, using dispersal and migration, suitable habitat areas. So uh, on that note, my colleagues Laroque, Green, Kelman, and I modeled tree species migration. We drew on uh, an extensive data set that I had collected along with uh, Kelman uh, and others in an eastern forest system that was quite fragmented uh, in southern Ontario. Uh, we used experimental and empirical studies to document uh, tree seedling establishment and migration into forest fragments as well as dispersal between them. So what that formed the basis for this model which you can see in this slide, the equation at the top, and you know, without getting too bogged down in details, essentially we predicted colonization density, which is F D at X is distance zero, as a function of species seed production, which was inversely related to their seed mass, a seed supply, which was related to tree density and basal area, and seedling survivorship, which was uh, related uh, directly to seed mass. That's the little m in the equation. Seedling, seed uh, tree density is nd and basal area is bm. This equation, by the way, comes from earlier studies by David Green, my colleague, and uh, Ed Johnson. And what we did was we parameterized it with my own experimental data as well as information in the literature on seed mass and dispersal mechanism. Again, this was based on seedling establishment experiments. Here you can see yellow birch. You can see um, uh, uh, hear me monitoring seedling establishment in plots. And with that revised model, we were able to uh, determine that predicted colonization densities from the models sort of significantly predicted, uh, had a significant relationship with empirically measured colonization densities at average distances of 50 meters from a seed source in my study area. And you can see the different tree species here. There's about 29 of them. We needed to add a dispersal terms. We added in uh, uh, an exponential decay function for um, seed dispersal, which was measured using some of my empirical um, seed colonization uh, measurements with respect to distance from source in my study area. We grouped that information according to dispersal mechanism, uh, bird, wind, rodent, as well as unspecialized, and seed mass, because those were uh, factors that influenced dispersal ability. But you can see in this diagram that there was decreasing probability of dispersal or colonization density, which is FD, uh, with distance from uh, the nearest conspecific uh, from 50 to 250 meters 
and that some species were better than others. So bird dispersed species like black cherry, American beech, and red oak were much better at dispersing long distances than were uh, species that were unspecialized with respect to dispersal mechanism or uh, had large seeds and relied on rodents. And I just want to show you uh, this next slide, something that puts that together. We looked at how our model predicted colonization density in stems per hectare for a different species grouped according to dispersal mechanism and seed size. And you can see the gray bars are the predicted, the white are the observed. And what we found was that our model was under predicting dispersal ability for bird dispersed species as well as medium seed size of wind dispersed species, but it was over predicting dispersal ability for these unspecialized and large seeded species. In fact, they didn't have any evidence of dispersal from seed sources more than 50 to 75 meters away. We concluded essentially that these large seeded rodent dispersed and unspecialized species had a threshold distance beyond which dispersal and colonization is improbable. Uh, and that, of course, will s severely limit their ability to colonize and maintain populations in flat landscapes under rapid climate change scenarios. So in conclusion, the car quorum uh, appears to be uh, representative of an alpine ecosystem in which species will experience compression and local disappearance of habitat as upslope migration occurs. And while refugia may remain on the highest peaks, local extinctions are likely. In eastern forests, species with limited dispersal and migration may face extinction in the absence of human intervention, such as managed relocation. Thank you.